All right, good morning. Um, welcome to the webinar. This webinar is Rainwater Harvesting. It's part of the Businesses Preventing Pollution webinar series, and we will have Dave Stark from Stark Rainwater Harvesting presenting the webinar today. Um, Dave is the owner of Stark Rainwater Harvesting and is an American Rainwater Catchment System Association accredited professional, instructor, and regional representative based in Duluth, Minnesota. He is an independent installer and consultant for rainwater management solutions and works with engineers and architects on re residential and commercial systems for multiple end use objectives. He drinks rainwater every day from a properly designed and disinfected rainwater system. Um, other than an increase and intensity in his speech patterns on the subject and inability to hear the code problems, appears to be suffering no long-term health effects from drinking the rainwater. So um, we have Dave here, and I will transfer it over to him now. Um, our webinar today is on rainwater harvesting. Um, specifically, I'm going to hit on a lot of different pieces on stormwater management. Uh, as in my introduction, uh, my company is Stark Rainwater Harvesting. We're based in Duluth, Minnesota, and we work closely with rainwater management solutions uh, out of the state of Virginia. We're going to uh, cover a lot of, lot of ground today in rainwater harvesting. Um, basically give you a little background about what we do and then that long acronym um, that was described ARCSA as the American Rainwater Catchment Systems Association. It's basically a nonprofit that I work with. I'm um, going to go through some basics, definitions, uh, how to put together an effective rainwater system, talk a little bit about uh, different type of roof drain systems, a uh, little on tank sizing, tank types, uh, water treatment, economic payback, freeze protection, codes, system examples, and then where to go for more information and training. We have been in the rainwater harvesting uh, business officially for about four years, uh, but have been harvesting rainwater at our home for uh, close to a decade now. Uh, through that process, we've uh, met a number of different people in the industry and now are partnered with Rainwater Management Solutions. We specifically uh, partnered with that company because of some of the products that they uh, carry called VC Filters, which you'll see a lot of slides of today. Uh, but we don't specify any single tank, so we work with um, a number of tank manufacturers. Uh, down on the lower right are basically some of the different products that we work with. Uh, but we think of ourselves more as system designers, uh, working with the engineers and architects uh, to come up with a low maintenance cost effective system. ARCSA um, was an organization I got introduced to in 2009. You can see the mission statement up there for ARCSA, promoting sustainable rainwater harvesting practices to help solve potable, non-potable, stormwater and energy challenges throughout the world. A big mission, um, but one that they basically accomplish uh, and are working on through different uh, workshops uh, and accreditation programs. Uh, we also hold an, an annual national conference. The conference this year was in Austin, Texas, where I presented some of the slides that you'll see today, just updates on codes. The last piece is that a number of the experts that work uh, within ARCSA a long time ago realized that the lack of code was uh, inhibiting the industry from growing. So over the course of about the last six years, they've developed code. They've actually developed a set of design guidelines um, and then worked with the national code bodies to write those, that language into the, into the new plumbing codes. And there will be more on, on that later. So obviously 
rainwater harvesting up here, a lot of folks, when you first hear about it, think about the dry desert or places um, that don't have a lot of water. And surely ARCSA and some of the first states that really were re-embracing this technology were in those dry areas. But if you look a little closer, actually, the areas that are doing most of the larger scale rainwater harvesting for stormwater management are based in areas with abundant rainfall. So obviously the water scarcity and the bills around the Northland are not really driving the market. That's not where I get my phone calls from. Most of my calls come from farmers, from people building green buildings, um, and now more um, from stormwater um, professionals that are trying to reduce peak flows uh, both to the rivers and then also because of combined sewer or separated sewer overflows. Um, the interest in lower uh, Minnesota is actually being driven by some declining aquifers in that area. Um, we also have some uh, geographic areas where we've done projects up the North Shore, for example, up near Hoveland, um, there is an area of basalt rock where groundwater levels are very deep and the water quality is very poor. So in instances like that, we've been brought in to do systems uh, in, that, in those areas. So I guess the first question that I pose is why, you know, why rainwater harvesting up here in the Northland? Um, and specifically from a stormwater management perspective, we think of it as the first piece in the treatment train. We're capturing that water off the roof, we're reducing velocity, and we're reducing the pollutant loads uh, in the stormwater. We're also off offsetting some of those peak water supply demands for a facility, reducing costs associated with the municipal water. Um, it's an, it's increases resiliency uh, against droughts. Also mitigates some of the impacts of impervious services um, and all of our systems. When we overflow them, we try to go to a secondary BMP um, to recharge that, that groundwater. So you may be working on a large site and you, the rain harvesting system may not be able to mitigate all of the impervious areas. Um, but if you use enough water out of the rain harvesting system, uh, you can, uh, in essence, negate the impervious area of, of the roof itself. Uh, it also extends the life of the existing water supply lines and delays some of the upgrades. So, we all know that within municipalities there are uh, large infrastructure bills. We're not saying that rainwater harvesting is going to replace um, those main municipal lines, but as, an, as a decentralized approach, um, it, it provides other options. So a few of the things that we don't call rainwater systems or why we really think that systems even as, as small as a, a rain barrel on up should kind of consider some of the design principles. These are some of the worst examples that we've seen, the one on the left. Um, you know, I've, I've built a few things that look like this in the past and we try to learn from our mistakes and use better products and better techniques and none of it is really that complicated, but some of the tricks of the trade that we've learned along the line um, help tremendously. And what they result in are higher water quality. And then, therefore, that water being able to be used for um, basically any use that, that you would like. We show that slide twice just because that's such a beautiful system. Probably wouldn't want to drink from it. As we discuss rainwater, oftentimes we have to kind of start out with what rainwater isn't, especially from a code perspective. 
when there aren't a lot of large systems in the area, people who have not received training on this um, oftentimes misinterpret. So what rainwater is not is recycled water, uh, nor is it reclaimed water or reused water. Uh, recycled water um, it could be like a gray water recycling system, water that goes down the drain and is recycled and reused in a different, different application. Sometimes you'll see that for flushing toilets. Reclaimed water more often is, is referred to when you're actually looking at a municipal combined sewage situation where they're reclaiming that water through very intense water treatment practices um, oftentimes distributed in purple pipe to um, non-potable applications. So that's what it's not. What rainwater really is, is a primary source of water. It's water that's never been used, and it's water that can be put to beneficial, beneficial uses. It's used just like when there is a pump uh, in the lake that's pulling water out, we use that water. When we have a pump down in a well, we use that water. When we capture the rainwater and we put it into a cistern, we use it. We don't reuse it, and we hammer on the definitions a lot because it gets very important that we're calling it what it is when we get into uh, code discussions. So here are a few definitions uh, from the arts lab design standards that have been developed. Um, you know, rainwater being water from natural precipitation that was not contaminated by use. Stormwater, on the other hand, uh, water that actually touches the ground and flows across the surface of the area, also termed surface water. So there are discussions all the time, well, isn't rainwater really stormwater? Yeah, it is. But when we're starting to look at an alternate source of water, and we're looking at all of the water sources on the site, and you've got a clean metal roof catchment, for example, that rainwater coming off the roof is a very, very different quality and a very different risk than stormwater. So we like the way that those codes are evolving and those definitions. Um, we're also very much into stormwater infiltration stormwater reuse in the proper applications, but those systems get more expensive and more complex. So we try to keep them simple. A couple other little uh, definitions down there that you can read at your leisure. So some of the uses of, of rainwater, uh, outdoor uses are what usually come to mind. Um, irrigation is the big one. Uh, sometimes car washing, indoor, non-potable uses. So probably the vast majority of the large commercial systems that are going in right now are using for outdoor irrigation and then toilet flushing. And that's just been an evolution of the codes and, and people um, accepting that, yeah, I guess we could probably take rainwater and flush a toilet with it. Um, it can also be used for laundry, uh, cooling purposes, and if the code exists in your jurisdiction, it can be used for indoor potable uses, everything from drinking, bathing, and cooking. So we're going way beyond the current model of sticking a rain barrel below a downspout, which we think is a wonderful thing. Um, but through the design process, we're basically able to produce potable water, um, and we utilize a system like this whenever we come back inside of the facility to do anything. So the point is we produce potable water for non-potable and potable uses if it, is, if it is allowed. I just got an email the other day from a friend that I worked with. Um, in South America uh, quite a while ago, about 15 years ago, and uh, I just thought it was interesting how she described that she's been down in Australia for 15 years, and 
discuss why the rainwater tanks and why they like drinking that water, and they're actually using uh, their other well water to flush the toilets. So it's a little different than what is happening uh, in the United States right now, but it gives you a perspective. Um, through ARCSA, too, another uh, really neat thing about attending those national conferences and getting to know uh, the people that are working on this issue all across the world are that we have an international side of the association as well. Um, and oftentimes folks from Australia, New Zealand, um, Europe will come to these conferences and give their perspectives uh, and we look at their code so that we're following some good industry practices. So now we'll get into a little bit of the design aspects of a, what we call a rainwater harvesting system. Is a rain barrel a system? Yes, it's a simple system. And when we get into uh, this, we're basically looking at every single surface that the rainwater comes in contact. So starting at the top, the catchment surface. There are better and worse catchment surfaces. And at the end use, if you're utilizing a asphalt roof, you'll have to have different water treatment to meet your end use goal. Overall, the best um, catchment surface is going to be uh, a metal roof, no lead, no copper, uh, or an, an approved uh, plastic roof coating. First flush uh, sometimes occurs within the better filters on the market or can be a separate, uh, a separate device in and, in and of itself. Basically taking the first flush or the first bit of rainfall when it starts to rain, which will have the highest level of contaminants, and we direct that to another secondary infiltration area. Um, you have to be very, very careful with first flush devices up here in the Northland because of freeze protection. Out of all the slides today, what I want you to, one of the take home points is this inlet filtration. Basically cleaning that rainwater before it goes into storage is the most important um, aspect of any rainwater harvesting system. It's going to maintain water quality. It's going to, um, basically it's going to meet the codes that are being written. Um, and it's, it's just can't be stressed enough how important that piece is. We'll go through these in a little bit more detail in further slide, but basically after we're into storage or a tank, um, we either have overflow that we're directing to uh, another secondary BMP, or um, oftentimes we'll have a makeup water supply uh, either through municipal or well water uh, into that tank. There we're into pumps and controls. Uh, like we say, in, indoor uses. Uh, we're almost always disinfecting the water, uh, either through the use of, well, the most common in the industry is ultraviolet uh, lights. Uh, oftentimes, we can also uh, incorporate ozone or chlorine systems if it's required by the code officials. Um, the outdoor uses, as long as you've followed those first four steps of cleaning the water before it goes into the tank, um, typically the water can be used out, outdoor for outdoor uses just by running through another sediment filter to make sure that your um, irrigation systems or drip emitters don't plug up. So the first thing that you're doing when you're looking at a rainwater harvesting system design is assessing your supply. So basically, um, you're looking at the footprint. If you're looking at a plan view of your building, it doesn't matter if your roof is pitched, round, multi-pitched. It's just the square footage of the footprint of the roof. So that is basically the length times the width to get your square footage. I have a Duluth example here. Um, if we had a 50 by 20 home, 1,000 square feet. 
Um, 0 0.623 is basically a conversion from square from inches of rain to gallons. And then I use 26 inches of rain for an annual monthly um, an annual total of rainfall in Duluth. Uh, we actually get about 31 inches, but obviously in our December, January, February window, it's, it's falling in uh, solid form. So we just take that out. And that's kind of the roughest way of looking at what we could capture from a building. But still, at, even at that, we're at about 16,000 gallons, a fair amount of water. Then when you're, um, the next step after you've determined what your supply is, is to look at the, look at your demand. Um, this is just another little example of where breaking up um, the home or the site into smaller watershed areas. What can we get from each one of those areas? And then what is our demand for that water? The demand, frankly, is is usually the hardest part when we start working with a client. Um, they'll say, how much is a rainwater harvesting system? Well, it depends on how much water you need. Because the, the size of the tank, as we'll go into later, is going to be dictated uh, by that water demand. And really, that's what we're doing, is trying to balance supply and demand. So just an example here showing uh, a comparison between the rain barrels and a, and a cistern. There's still a storage device. Um, some are approved for uses uh, with potable uh, water, some are not. But we're basically trying to balance that supply and demand. Um, now I'm going to get into a little bit more of the details of the, the systems that we work with and those in that spreadsheet of, of the pieces of the system and kind of go through those. But basically any good rainwater harvesting system is always going to have these four components. The first is that self-cleaning filter. We use the VC Vortex filters because they add oxygen. They have a full system bypass and they filter the water down to 280 microns. Uh, what that allows you to do is to never have to go into that tank and clean it. Whenever you talk to anybody in the Northland about a stormwater BMP or a new practice, one of the critical things that you have to consider is what is the maintenance on that system. The fact that you don't have to go into a large cistern, especially um, with confined space entry, to clean that, clean that tank out um, saves tremendously. Is there, is there some maintenance on this filter? Yes. Um, if you put in really high quality gutter covers, you almost probably once a year have to go in and, and remove that. There's a stainless steel insert. Um, if you don't, it's probably about three times a year. But it's a simple removal clean the filter off, stick it back in. The second part is called a smoothing inlet. What that is is basically driving the water um, from the filter down to the bottom of the tank, and that adds oxygen as well. Third step is a floating intake filter, where basically that's attached to the pump. So it protects the pump, but it also pulls water from the cleanest portion of the tank, which is typically about 68 inches below the surface. When water enters the tank, it does, the contaminants basically do one of three things. They either sink, they float, or they dissolve. We deal with the dissolving, uh, dissolved materials in the water treatment process. The sinkers, we basically set our pumps so that we don't suck the very, very bottom of the tank. And then the floaters, the light things that float on top of the water, actually go into this last overflow device, and it skims the surface, creates a trap, um, which also keeps rats and cats out of your tank, a very, very important thing to keep the vermin out of the tank for water quality. 
um, and then that overflows to our to our final system. So I'm going to run through these quickly, um, but just some other some other um, shots of the four steps, basically. The neat thing about this is that we do these four steps on every system that we do, from small 500-gallon systems all the way up to millions of gallons. Um, they don't have to be as complicated as what you're seeing here, um, but we can do these same steps with cheaper uh, components as well. So with those vortex filters, uh, the water is coming in through the inlet. Um, the, as it starts to rain and that stainless steel filter is not um, completely saturated, the dirty water goes out and we tie that into our stormwater system. The, after that, after it gets saturated, that stainless steel filter gets saturated, the water is actually pulled into the tank. Um, that's the removable stainless steel filter. There's a collecting space around there. It's all uh, UV resistant uh, polyethylene. It can be installed above or below grade. So basically when we're doing that system design and we've looked at your, your footprint of your home or your business, uh, we're choosing the appropriate filter for the square footage uh, of that area. So on the smallest, on the garden downspout filters, those go right into, right into your downspout and can capture from 1,000 square feet. All the way up to the WFF 300, uh, which can capture from little less than an acre, 32,292 square feet. If you think of a flat roof building like a Walmart, um, we can basically capture water off of all of that, filter it down to 400 microns, and send it, send it down to the tank. A few shots of the columning inlet, water entering. We're basically just driving the pipe to the bottom, bottom of the tank and directing that energy back up. What that does is, is basically prevents the disturbance of all of the sediment and the biofilms that have grown on the inside of the tank. So if you imagine water coming off of a roof uh, from 30 feet out and you just had a straight pipe going into the top of the tank, every time that it rained, it would mix that water up and make it harder to deal with. Simple. Everything up to this point is all gravity. In fact, the four steps are all gravity. The filter pulling just from below the surface, and then that overflow siphon. In this diagram, at the bottom of the vortex filter, it shows um, you know, the contaminated water going to the left. We actually typically tie that back in to the overflow to step four so that we're directing all of that um, water to another secondary BMP. And then beyond, um, those four steps, we basically treat to the proper water quality standard or the intended end use. So when you're outside of the building, those four steps are enough. As long as your code says that it's, it's fine to go, um, we have the science, we can prove that the water quality is good, um, you're good to go. When you come back into the building, um, in America, it's typically required that we produce potable quality water. Um, so we do that in a water treatment system. The one on the left is a typical residential treatment system. And almost, a, you know, almost exclusively rainwater harvesting systems use this treatment train. And it goes like this. The first blue filter is a sediment filter. The second filter um, typically is a carbon filter. And then the third and final filter, even though it's not shown in this residential unit, is an ultraviolet light. So the sediment lowers the turbidity so that the UV light works. 
the carbon takes care of taste, other inorganics, and then the UV is inactivating the DNA of the bacteria that can get you sick. Um, and then those systems basically, uh, the one on the right, even though it's much more complicated, uh, looking, bigger pumps, bigger distributions, more controls, uh, it's still following that same treatment train. Once we get down into the pumping, um, it's basically the same as a well pump. Um, but we consider different ways to, to set, those, set those up. Um, sometimes we'll have a flooded suction pump, um, submersible pumps, sometimes pumps inside of the building, sometimes transfer pumps. Um, but at the end of the day, anybody who sized a well pump um, on the smaller residential systems, uh, it's basically the same, same idea. So once we're pumping out, and if we're going back into the building, that's when we're going through additional water treatment. Just a uh, little sizing spreadsheet here, and of course we could do a full day on pump sizing and um, what all is involved with that, but um, at the end of the day you're basically looking at a pump curve and trying to find uh, the happy spot below that curve uh, where you're meeting the gallons per minute um, and the total dynamic head, uh, and that's how you're choosing the correct pump for your end use application. Now most systems um, will require some kind of seamless backup uh, because a quite common question is, well Dave, what if it doesn't rain? Um, so if it doesn't rain, there are proven and code compliant ways to back up rainwater systems with either uh, municipal water or a well. Um, so those two, two ways main ways of doing that are through what's called an air gap um, or a reduced or a solenoid valve with an RPZ. So the RPZ actually runs right in the plumbing line. The air gap is a physical uh, separation in between um, that municipal water and the rainwater. So we have a note up there that for stormwater management, um, municipal backup shouldn't occur in the tank. What we really mean is with that air gap. Uh, the reason for that is if it's a very large tank, like a 100,000 gallon tank, giving up the four inches um, in that tank for that air gap, it costs a fair amount of money. And of course there are optional accessories. Um, this is the Series 200 controller, which basically will do uh, an amazing amount of analysis of your system. It can measure the incoming uh, water flows, the overflows, uh, real-time water quality. Um, it can schedule the maintenance and then can serve everything up to the uh, to the internet. Obviously, this is not a this is not a a device that would typically be put in a residential application really much more for integrating a large commercial system into, say, a, um, a baseball stadium where we can actually serve that data, serve the education, serve the, serve the data up so that people can interact with it and see the real benefits of the rainwater harvesting system. So those are basically all of the pieces, and I thought I'd just throw in a few of um, the system schematics with all of those pieces put together. In this system, once again, we have those same four steps. This is a below ground system detail um, with an outdoor hydrant. So as you see, we're coming off of the tank. No additional treatment there. The box is indicating a, a home. Once we go inside of that home, we're going to be required to treat to a further further and higher water quality. Same uh, type of situation here. This is an above ground tank. Same four steps. Um, we're going inside of the home, so we've got 
um, a pump system with that with the treatment, and then the 12 through 15 up there is a municipal backup, one way to set it up. So basically, when the float switch in the tank goes down, we are says we're out of rainwater, seamlessly switches over to the municipal supply, and is protected um, by the backflow preventers. Um, and so really, even in this situation, the treated rainwater that's come up to potable level still does not um, physically come in contact with the municipal water. So often done on the large commercial systems are that instead of trying to keep um, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water treated, we do those four steps on a big tank outside that's serving those stormwater purposes. And then we pump slowly through a system inside of the building to a day tank. And that day tank basically is sized to meet the demand uh, of the facility. So, we have a lot of different tanks that we can look at, and this is maybe a bit of an outdated slide, but it gives you a pretty good idea. Um, when you're down below 5,000 gallons, um, typically plastic polyethylene tanks are the most cost effective. Um, we uh, typically stock anything from 500 to 2,500 gallon plastic tanks. Um, but then when we're going above 5,000 gallons, uh, we're typically looking at either fiberglass tanks and sometimes uh, actually pipe-based tanks, a company called ADS Pipe, uh, working with BC to basically have uh, pipe systems that we can size in any configuration with the four steps, um, cost-effective, load-rated uh, tanks that can go below uh, your parking lot or building. This is uh, off of the Harvest H2O website, but it does a really good job of kind of going through the pros and cons, um, not from a tank manufacturer, but from a guy who distributes uh, information on rainwater harvesting and really describes uh, all the pros and cons. So a good source to look at. So obviously we have uh, you know, all these different options uh, for tank types. Um, and what, what we do, uh, you know, the simplest on the left there would be a, just a downspout filter going into a tank. Uh, we also sell uh, completely pre-plumbed packaged systems so we basically get semi-loads of tanks, we build them to look like the second picture, um, and we basically will deliver them to the site and work with the general contractor and installers or bring our own uh, to put that in the ground. Uh, the ADS tanks there uh, are on the right-hand side and then fiberglass tanks. One exciting tank option for me I get excited about tank options, are a company called FTC, which is that modular version down below. That's a one million gallon uh, installation. But they're definitely more expensive than plastic tanks, but they are insulated uh, and they are rectangular and they're modular. So we've had a couple uh, applications where we've looked at uh, actually building those inside of, inside of the home. I haven't done one yet, but I think there's uh, great promise for that. And of course, you know, concrete or custom systems. That's a mi over a million gallon system on the right hand side there, all tied together with a series of those 32,000 square foot BC filters. You can take ugly tanks and make them pretty by wrapping them with wood or buying them that way. And then Whenever we're looking at rain harvesting up here, and something that I brought up to the ARCSO organization were all these pictures uh, from Texas just weren't going to cut it up here when it gets 40 below for a week. Um, so we basically have tried a lot of different products. Um, we've settled on those VC filters and come up with a few tricks that we'll, we'll be writing into a chapter 
uh, for the new uh, ARCS manual that's going to be published this year. So basically using the appropriate equipment, making sure that you've got slope system bypass and ways to decommission the system in the winter, um, depth of burial, insulation, uh, buoyancy, um, and if you don't ensure that within your design and do the math to determine um, that things are, you're not going to create giant ice cubes, um, it's advised that you uh, add some redundancy with tank heaters, heat trays uh, into your designs. Just a couple of resources here um, for information on cold weather rainwater harvesting. Yes, sometimes I hear we're not going to, we can't capture rainwater up here. It's too cold. It's cold in Alaska. They do it there. It's a really neat little um, uh, publication there. And you can read more about it, but it was basically translated from uh, Norway. And so there's a bunch of different um, design schematics showing different ways to um, freeze protect systems. Probably the best um, guidance document that I've seen on freeze protection are the recently published Ontario guidelines for rainwater harvesting. Um, we've uh, presented in our joint partners with the Canadian Rainwater Association, but that book is available online and has some really good uh, diagrams in them, like this one, which I basically translated over into English units and used when we design systems to ensure that we've got the proper depth of burial and we've got the proper insulation um, to make sure that those uh, systems don't freeze. Some of the other um, topics that come up in rainwater harvesting are just related to, to water quality. What is the quality? We've seen bad pictures of bad systems We've seen rain barrels that have been filled with, with pollen and have vermin growing in them. So there, we're not saying that rainwater is not, uh, there isn't a potential for that, for, that, for that microbial risk. But as it's fallen from the sky, um, it's one of the cleanest water sources available. Um, in addition to it being clean, it's some of the some of the physical characteristics of hardness and sodium content being essentially zero makes it a fantastic water source in the in the home. So if you're able to use it to wash your dishes, you will notice instantly that without the addition of fur further chemicals uh, or um, softening agents, you have crystal clear glasses. Of course, uh, it is slightly acidic in nature, um, but it typically doesn't cause any, any problem uh, as long as you've utilized the proper materials that are outlined in those arts of design guidelines. Basically, if you're not using copper, um, it's not going to be a problem. If pH is a problem and you're designing that system, uh, you can buffer that through different types of filters or by just adding um, sodium bicarbonate. The reason that we choose to utilize rainwater rather than stormwater um, for a use, whether it be outdoor um, irrigation or coming back into the building, is this main point. You know, on average, 2 to 20 parts per million total dissolved solids compared to other water supplies you know, municipal water supplies from 100 to 800. In the water treatment world, what that translates to is there's not a lot of stuff dissolved in it, and therefore it's easy from a pump perspective to filter that filter filter the water physically with physical filtration, just like those big blue well filters that you see. Of course, beyond that, there is the chance for microbial risk, so that's why we utilize some form of disinfection, whether it be UV, ozone, or chlorine. 
Another uh, little thing that we refer to off of that Harvest H2O website is a study that was done, I believe, in um, New Mexico, but basically comparing a cistern, a well, and city water. Obviously, that's going to be different for every source that you compare. Uh, but we've done our own cistern versus our own well, uh, coming up with the, the same type of results. So you'll notice here that under the coliform bacteria, which is going to be the largest concern uh, from a health professional, that it's present. Yes, it's present in the cistern. I'm not sure what kind of pre-filtration they used on that system, but but it's easily filtered out with those, with those disinfection areas. A couple other things I'll point out, just the low metal contents, um, slightly more uh, acidic, 6.9 on the pH, um, and that alkalinity of zero. I don't know if I agree with the total dissolved solids of zero, but low nonetheless. One of the problems that we've seen, because there wasn't the code for rainwater harvesting years ago, was that not many people were testing their water. It's just like a well. You get it in, you do one or two tests, you think it's safe, you should disinfect it every year, you should test it every year, but not many people do. This is one of our colleagues down in Florida who has a potable rainwater harvesting system, and since 2000, and nine, he has tested his rainwater against uh, the municipal water for all primary and secondary drinking water contaminants. We're working as a national organization to actually create a database um, of those results so that we can see which systems are producing the highest quality and we can improve on our designs. But basically, um, these reports are available if you ever want to see them. Um, and the water quality from the rainwater harvesting system comes out very nicely. Um, just in terms of roof drainage, something that uh, is an improved use here in Minnesota, but not many people know about, are things called siphonic roof drains. So these are actually cross-sections looking through the side of a building. So if you would imagine uh, a box store um, and a typical uh, roof drain system shown on the right, you would have multiple downspouts coming down the building every so many feet. Um, and those are based on gravity flow, so non-full pipe flow, water flowing down. As we talked about uh, freeze protection, um, you know, and getting the slope on those lines to actually get to the uh, cistern at the proper elevation, not to mention all of those pipes come with a cost. So that's the way that it's typically done, but if you're ever building a new building, um, I would suggest looking at siphonic roof drains. But what that is is basically as the water fills on the roof, and the roof does need to be designed differently, but the water in the pipe fulls, fl flows full. <laughs> and so obviously you're reducing the number of pipes, and the beauty is you can be taking all of the water off of that roof, running to uh, a VC300 filter, and into your, into your system. It's a beautiful combination of techniques. This is actually a slide from the national conference last week. Um, and obviously, you know, we don't have those big problems up north of water scarcity, but what we do have um, are problems with combined or separated uh, storm sewer overflows. We're really looking at stormwater management with rainwater harvesting. We're trying to reduce that peak flow um, to the receiving body of water. So by capturing it and by using that water out of the tank, we create room for the next storm event and it does uh, function as an effective 
rainwater harvesting system and a best management practice. So a few methods for modeling. Uh, things that we stay away from are actual monthly budgets. We at RMS utilize a daily tank simulation model, uh, basically looking at the water coming in, the water coming out, the water overflow, and what percentage of the demand that we've calculated has been met. This is one of the kickouts from the model that we run. So this, for example, Duluth, Minnesota, set was a, a, a residential application, 73 gallons of demand per day, roof area 2,500 square feet. What we're modeling are tanks from 3,000 gallons in size all the way up to 11,500. And we're seeing what percentage of that demand is, is met. So the model kicks out a curve, and basically where that curve starts to flatten out, anything above that is really not, um, you're paying for more tank than you need. The final part is a kick out that shows um, anything above or around 90% of meeting that demand would be a sizing that we would recommend. I think in this one we actually came back in at about 7,500 gallons uh, as a recommendation. In addition to sizing the tank correctly, on top of that demand, you can also add additional storage to your tank to um, buffer an additional storm event. So if your 100-year event is 3 inches and you're designing the system to meet that, we can also add that volume on top. This tank setup, when you see the orifice, that small orifice could be a half inch, it could be a three-quarter inch, basically just a weep line. So when the water fills to that point, um, it's overflowing. In a huge storm event, it's going to fill the entire tank and go through the emergency overflow. But just some little tricks to set up tanks uh, to serve those multiple uh, objectives. It obviously can infiltrate any of the water into the ground as well, but we say why not use it first, have some economic payback, and then go from there. Some of the best guidance that I've seen, some of the reasons that we partnered with RMS is that um, they did the stormwater modeling uh, and developing uh, incentives in the state of Virginia. Now a little bit closer to home for you folks. Wisconsin, um, when you start looking at your own codes, you have to see which plumbing code you fall under. Uh, Wisconsin falls under the universal plumbing code. That's a beautiful thing. And I'll tell you why. Because within the universal plumbing code, there are other um, there are other plumbing documents. Uh, this one specifically is the IAPO Green Plumbing Supplement uh, that's being published in 2012. Um, because ARCS has been involved with the language, basically those design guidelines have been changed. I've been on the national committee. Um, to come up with an ANSI standard for rainwater harvesting. Um, and those pieces are getting written into code. Other states um, work under what's called the Inter International Plumbing Code, um, which has a different code process, but we're currently trying to work with all of those folks right now. In a few states, like Minnesota, they don't adhere to a national code. They have their own code. So in Minnesota, we have the Minnesota Plumbing Code. Um, and so it doesn't have references to these things. But my understanding is that Minnesota is looking at adopting the Universal Plumbing Code. The point is that within, within these documents, all of the things that code officials are typically and rightfully concerned about, maintenance, water quality, water quality requirements, testing, maintenance, are all within those codes. Other places and resources to look for rules on rainwater harvesting, the Harvest H2O website. And then also uh, the con Conference on State Legislatures has got a page specifically on rules around the state. 
So you can see we're up Minnesota, Wisconsin, no current rule, but that doesn't mean that you can't do a rainwater harvesting system. You need to talk to your code officials, you need to um, educate them, um, and you need to put in systems that produce good water quality. I also consulted last year with a group down in Milwaukee that was looking at um, you know, what, not wanting to put in complex systems um, and ran into some code issues, but they produced a document. Um, so basically some best, best practices, things that need to be addressed to get the proper codes. And fresh off the presses, um, I actually received an email last night that uh, I sit on the National Technical Committee um, and the American Society of Plumbing Engineers and ARCSA um, have been working the last couple of years on pr producing a standard. Same deal, how do we put these systems together? And yesterday that ARCSA ASPE standard 63 uh, was approved. If you're working with an engineer or an architect, this is a fantastic paper, a bit dated, but it basically um, gives them um, a good guideline on how to do an alternate material or method request. So if your state or local jurisdiction does not have specific language about rainwater harvesting in their code, you go through this process and engineers uh, submit uh, those and more times than not they will be, they will be approved, um, but it can take some time. Now I'm getting close to the end of my session here, so I'm going to um, quickly run through uh, a number of system examples. This is our home um, and our simplest system. Uh, just a downspout filter, a little solar pump on it, and you can see my son down there with a giant carrot that he grew. Down in our basement, this is our rainwater harvesting system, which has evolved over time. It has the VC4 steps, and then you see our treatment system on the right. I would change it. I would change a number of things about it, and uh, but it has produced good water quality. We've worked on a demonstration project down in Duluth for over three years, just uh, on the permitting piece, but that was built in August um, and is online now. You can give tours there or at our house. This is basically one of the vortex filters attached to a building, so they can be in or out. We work with Victus Farms at UMD, um, providing uh, the components, not the design nor installation uh, of systems up there. Then for my partners out in Virginia, the regional jail, basically used for uh, a number of different purposes. We've got um, toilet flushing, non-potable uses, fiberglass tanks. We wanted because uh, my understanding was that the talk today was for businesses. so. I tried to hit on it as we've gone quickly through a lot of information, but basically the way that we make a rainwater harvesting system cost effective is that we can reduce the stormwater infrastructure. If we have a tank, we can downsize those stormwater ponds, which have value from the terms of uh, real estate. We have offset water costs. Uh, we have potentials and systems that have gone in where because we're supplying so much water that they've been able to reduce the size of the water main coming into the facility. That can be a huge cost in a large commercial development. And then as we you know, talked about the siphonic drains, um, you could basically reduce some of your piping and infrastructure and stormwater pipe uh, costs around the building if we're brought in early and working with both the civil and mechanical engineers. You know that the price of water, maybe not so much in our neck of the woods, um, but it is going up. And that rise in water cost is going to be reflective in the return on the investment on the system. So this is the Manassas uh, School that I'll show a few slides on. But basically, um, you know, with increasing water costs, you're going to have 
faster returns on the investment. Oscar Smith Middle School, um, tanks, uh, the Manassas Park Elementary School, always trying to provide some level of education to um, describe what's being done with these systems. Even at the state capitol out in Virginia, because their state has embraced this technology, they have, they're adding jobs, business, um, and they have their legislature on board to the tune of a 20,000 gallon uh, system there. So I think I hit 1030 right on the nose. Um, I will be available here for a few minutes for questions. Um, and I wanted to include the slide, the uh, web pages, the places that I've mentioned throughout this, and a few of those other really good guides. Um, but I hope you uh, learn more about rainwater harvesting through ARCSA. If you want to uh, take it further, what we've done in one hour today, we do one day through three-day full courses. And we'd like to train more people at Extension, at Sea Grant, uh, at the universities in this um, art of rainwater harvesting. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you, Dave. We actually did not have any questions submitted during the webinar, so we can end it right now. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for presenting, and thank you to those of you who are listening. Um, this is the last webinar in our Environmental Matters, or sorry, Business is Preventing Pollution webinar series. We do have one Environmental Matters webinar uh, next week, Tuesday, November 26th at noon. And that will be about the educational efforts here at the City of Superior. So thank you for attending, and we'll end the webinar now.